So there I was, freshman year uh, of college, and I was ready to conquer the world. I went to Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas for a number of different reasons. I was on a tennis scholarship, so I was able to play tennis there. Uh, my, my parents went there, and so that was kind of, uh, you know, a natural thing for me to do. I wanted to join a social club, and I believed that God was calling me to a wild and passionate career of mechanical engineering. Now, I'm sure for those of you who have been to college, you know that either being an engineering major or being a NCAA athlete or uh, joining a social club, all that sort of stuff, all of that is hard in and of itself. But together, I mean, it, it's just a lot. But listen, I was up for the task. My roommate was too. He was also an engineering major. He was also joining a social club. He was also on the tennis team. We were just going to do this together. It, it, we, we figured we could do it. Um, and, and I worked so hard. I really did. I gave it my all. At least I thought I did. I played tennis about two and a half to three hours every single day uh, my freshman year. I studied my butt off and I went to all of the social functions, not really missing one. And that lasted probably a couple of weeks. Then I got tired. And then sometimes I would have to miss two straight days of classes because the tennis team had to go somewhere and play in this tournament or something like that. Uh, my, my coach hated the fact that I did other social club sports, like I'd play basketball and volleyball. He didn't want me to get hurt, and so I had to quit doing that. I remember being so tired during my pledge week, because I was studying so much, being so tired during my pledge week that I would literally walk around tennis practice in between points with my eyes closed, just to try to get some form of rest. My roommate felt the pressure too. Anybody want to guess what happened? By the end of our semester, both of our grades were pitiful. We both dropped out of the chemistry class that we were struggling in, and, and we barely kept a C average. Because of that, we had, get this, ready? We had a combined roommate total of 12 credit hours. If you understand how credit hours works, you can laugh at that. Because of that, we were both kicked off of the tennis team uh, that first semester. Uh, and of course, we had a club jersey. We, play, we paid the, the club fees, but we barely knew anybody there. And I say all that to say this. When you try to do multiple things well, you end up doing nothing well. Is that true? Yeah, when you try to do multiple things well, you end up doing nothing well. When we tried to fit in multiple places, we ended up really fitting in nowhere. Like I said, we barely knew the people in our club. We felt ostracized by the people on the tennis team because we got kicked off. And the people that were in our classes, uh, well, you know, they just kind of looked down on us because we were complaining about our grades. But let's be honest, we weren't doing the stuff they were doing. We weren't putting in the work that they were putting in. But I did learn one thing in that chemistry class that I failed. And it was the definition of the word pure. Now, I've, all, I've grown up, and I'm sure a lot of you have too, uh, grown up with the, what the Christian definition of pure is. And that means saving yourself sexually for marriage, right? Don't have sex before marriage. Purity. That's not what it means at all. I, I don't really know where we got that. The word purity is a chemistry word. And all it means is this. It means unmixed with anything else. That's all it means, unmixed with anything else. And Mandarin, I've got a question for you this morning, ready? Does this describe your Christianity? Seriously, think about it. Does this describe your Christianity? Because this word, the word pure or purity, that is the problem that I believe that Jesus Christ had with a small church named Laodicea. Now, I understand that you guys just recently talked about this. So when Mike Johnson called and said, hey, would you come and, and do this? I said, yeah, sure, what do you want to talk about? He said, whatever. And I said, how about this? And he's like, well, we just talked about it. But he said, but I would love them to hear like a totally different view of it or a totally different, like a second opinion. Uh, so I said, okay, let's do it. And so we're going to read this morning a passage that I know you've already read. Uh, and everybody's read it before, but go ahead if you've got your Bible. Revelation chapter 3. You can follow it all along on the screen or you, you can read it in your Bible. But this is what it says. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this. 
These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus, Jesus says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see those whom I love I, ready, rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Did you catch the ugly truth there? Well, the ugly truths. <laughs> Jesus tells the Laodiceans this, you're not hot, you're not cold, so you know what I really think of you? I find you completely disgusting. You gross me out. I don't want any part of it. There isn't much I can do with you, therefore I'm going to chew you up and spit you out of my mouth into the trash. Now, I know you guys just read all the letters to the churches of Asia, and if you read all of them, Jesus, let's just put it this way, he ain't super gentle, is he? <laughs> He's pretty harsh. He's got some harsh things to say, especially to Sardis. You remember what he says to Sardis? He says, listen, there is only a couple of you in here who really are even followers of me at this point. But after studying the seven letters to the churches of Asia, what I found is this. There is only one church where Jesus says literally not one thing positive. And it's this one. It's to Laodicea. Why? Why does Jesus not find one thing positive to say? Guys, it's because of this. It's because you can't do much with a bunch of lukewarm Christians. You just can't. You cannot do much with a bunch of lukewarm Christians. I've got a confession this morning. I'm a big drinker. I really am. And it's, it's kind of a problem. I don't mean alcohol, okay? I, I, don't, I don't mean that. What I mean is, literally, if there is a cup of liquid in front of me, I have to drink it. It's this weird, compulsive behavior. If you've ever been out to lunch with me, you'll notice it. Why does everyone else have one or two glasses, but I end up with six on the table? I don't know. It just, it, it's, it's who I am. It's a compulsive behavior. You can ask my wife. You can ask Megan. If we go to Starbucks together, I get my drink. She gets her drink. My drink's gone about two minutes. I, ha I just have to reach across and start sipping her drink. It's this weird thing. I just, it's who I am. I will end up drinking it because when it comes to liquid refreshment, I literally have zero self-control. I literally have zero self-control. And that is why it is vitally important for me to drink water. It is vitally important for me to drink water. I love water. Raise your hand if you're a big water drinker in the room. Yeah, you guys know, right? You guys know water is so, so good. To put it simply, let's just, let's just say this, right? There is literally nothing that is more refreshing than water. Can I get an amen? I mean, literally, there is nothing more refreshing than water. If you are super thirsty and it's hot outside, there is nothing better than a glass of ice cold water. And talk about purity, right? The water is the definition of pure. Why? Well, what's in water? It's just water. <laughs> H2O, that's all it is. There's literally nothing else in it. That's why you have to have six to eight cups of it every single day, and it's so good for you, right? Let's read the label. Zero calories, zero fats, zero carbs, zero sugars. It's the perfect drink. It's amazing for you. Water is perfect for you. It's the source of life. You have to have it to survive. And thank God you do because it's so refreshing. Can I get an amen from our water drinkers? Yes, and I, I really do try to drink a lot of water. But you guys know how it is. Because when the spirit is willing, the flesh is often weak. Because as much as I love water, I love Coke too. I absolutely love Coke. Coke is literally the polar opposite of water, isn't it? It is literally the polar opposite. Coke is so, so, so bad for you. It's my impression that, that 
It's not McDonald's, it's not genetics, it's not our easy access to fatty foods. It is literally Coke that is the reason that our nation is the most unhealthy and fattest nation that has ever crossed planet Earth. It's Coke. It really is. But you know what? After a long work week, yeah, you know, after a long work week, and I'm tired, it's time for date night, me and Megan, we go to the movies a lot during our, our date nights. And, and here's the deal. If you're a big movie goer, you know you don't just go to the movies. You have to get the popcorn, right? You have to get the popcorn. And so I'm sitting in the movie theater. I'm guzzling down all this popcorn. No self-control, remember? Guzzling down all this popcorn. And the movie's going well, but it's super salty and it's buttery. And the kernels are getting stuck in your throat. They're kind of sharp. And listen, God forbid that you should ever wash down popcorn with water. Am I right? I mean, our moviegoers, you know this. God forbid you wash it down with water. Having a water at the movies is like one of the seven deadly sins, at least in my opinion. Why? It's because sometimes, especially when you're, drink, when you're eating popcorn, like Coke just tastes better. It just goes better. As much as I really do love water, I also love Coke. Can I get an amen from some of our Coke drinkers? Raise your hand if you're a Coke drinker in the room. You love Coke as well. Yes. This is where I have to be careful because after church today, me and Megan, we're going to go out to lunch and I can order a Coke. And if I'm not careful before the meal shows up, I could have three empty glasses right there. And I'll just become another crisis or another statistic or a national health crisis. Some of you right now, your, your mouth just, you, it did that thing. You did that thing because you heard it, right? And it really is good, isn't it? Unlike water, Coke is dark and it's strong. It's got that smell. It's got that flavor. It's got, that, it's got those bubbles. It's got the acidity as it kind of goes down your throat, right? Do we dare read the label? In just one can, we have 140 calories, 45 milligrams of sodium, 39 carbs, 39 grams of sugar. And if you pour this into a glass, it's one glass, and if you're like me, it's easy to have four, isn't it? It's just so, so easy to have four. But guys, guess what? Sometimes I just don't. And here's what I think. I'm assuming you guys have felt this tension in your Christian life before, haven't you? Haven't you? You know this. You felt this before. You have the desire to drink water, and you know that you should because it's what's pure, it's what's good for you, it's the only thing that truly refreshes you. God literally created you to live this kind of a lifestyle, but so often the situations, just like popcorn, the situations that we find ourselves in this world just don't really pair well with this kind of a lifestyle. It just goes better with this. It pairs so much better with a lifestyle that is impure. So often we find ourselves being drawn towards what is bad for us in our Christian lives. We stop craving the living water. We, became, we begin to crave what is dark simply because, let's just be honest, we enjoy it more. Even though God never designed you to live this kind of a life because this kind of life is terrible for you and it will kill you. You following so far? I, I feel like this is Romans 7. I don't know if you've read Romans 7 in a while. Romans 7 is that super famous passage that Paul wrote that says, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I do want to do, and uh, I'm frustrated. That's my summary of Romans 7, right? Uh, I'm frustrated. I believe that when Paul was writing that, the first edit, the first edit, he probably had a Coke in a water sitting right in front of him. It probably sounded a little bit like this. He says in Romans 7, I find this law at work with me, although I want to drink water. Coke is always on the menu. Can I, 
I mean, we just get that, right? I mean, what attention? What, even though I want to drink water, Coke is always on the, menu, on the menu. In my inner stomach, I love water, but I find that my inner stomach also loves Coke. This water and Coke lifestyle, they, ra- they rage war on my taste buds. What a wretched man I am. Who is going to sort this out for me? How can I drink what I desire but still find my body in a healthy condition? And that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? How can I drink what I desire but still find my body in a healthy condition? Praise God. Hallelujah. Because on the eighth day, God created the Diet Coke. (laughs) Diet Coke is for people who just want it all, isn't it? Diet Coke is for people who want to, they, they want to drink Coke, but they still want to reap the benefits of having a water kind of a lifestyle, right? That's how they market it, don't they? They say it tastes just like Coke. Sounds just like Coke. Kind of smells just like Coke. It's got the same color as Coke. It's got the same bubbles. It's got the same acidity. But hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Let's read the label. Zero Zero calories, zero fats, zero carbs, zero sugar. Finally, it's a drink that is literally two things in one. It is Coke and it's Diet Coke and it's amazing. Of course, until you drink it. Because what I have found is that if you're like me and you love both water and Coke, usually you find this disgusting. Now, maybe Satan has led you astray somewhere. He's led your taste buds astray, and he has deceived you into thinking that Diet Coke actually is a tasty drink and actually is good, and there isn't that horrible, like, taste at the end of it, and it's this great drink. And, and I'm gonna actually under the uh, impression that it is Mike Johnson himself. He's been deceived. He's a big Diet Coke drinker. Maybe we should pray for him. I don't know. Maybe we should. But here's the deal. I don't know too many people that love diet. You want to know why? Because we already talked about this. Because when you try to be multiple things at once, you end up being nothing. When you try to be water and Coke at the same time, the people who love water and Coke will find you disgusting. When you try to do it all your first semester in college, you're going to end up doing nothing. When you try to be both holy and worldly, you're going to end up alienating yourselves from both groups of people. When you try to turn on both the hot and the cold water, when you take a shower, only a nasty, lukewarm water is going to come out. And when you want to taste like the world through your actions but still reap the benefits of having a Christian label, Jesus finds you absolutely disgusting. And so today, this Diet Coke can is going to be our physical manifestation of what it looks like to be a lukewarm Christian. If you're a lukewarm Christian in the audience today, this is you. Here you are, right here. I was, uh, in preparing for this, I was looking through... um, Uh, Diet Coke slogans through the years And and it's hilarious because They're the perfect slogan for the lukewarm Christian Like this metaphor works so good Uh, 1993 Taste it all is what Diet Coke says And that's what lukewarm Christians want to do right A little bit of this A little bit of that A little bit over here A little bit there Like they just taste it all Purity no who cares Taste it all you can do it Uh, How about 2002 Do what feels good If it's listening to a great sermon then do it If it feels good you don't want a, one that doesn't feel good. If it's, if it's doing this thing on Saturday, then do it. Do what feels good. You know, whatever. Uh, how about the one that's, that's current, okay? Uh, because I can. Because I can what? Because I can taste it all. Because I can do whatever feels good. It's my life. I'm going to just, you know, whatever I want to do. Because I can. And we all know that this isn't what real Christianity looks like, of course. This isn't what real discipleship looks like. When Jesus was talking to the Diet Coke Christians at Laodicea, he practically begged them to pick a side, hot or cold, doesn't matter. Just pick a side, but you cannot try to be both because when you try to be both a follower of Jesus and a follower of the world, Jesus finds you absolutely disgusting. Now make no mistake about it, uh, 
I kind of grew up under the impression that lukewarm Christians were people that kind of just sat in the pews and didn't really do much, didn't really care. I think that's actually the wrong definition of what it means to be lukewarm. I always thought lukewarm Christians were people who weren't really passionate about anything. I think, actually, that's far from it. They're very passionate. A lukewarm Christian is someone who is kind of passionate about everything. And they pursue all of these things half-heartedly. This past week, I was trying to come up with good examples of of lukewarm Christians in the Bible other than the Laodiceans. The best one I could think of was the rich young ruler. He was kind of lukewarm, wasn't he? Like he wore the nice clothes to church, said the right things. He probably served some people. Overall, he was a great guy. And he felt like his, felt like his label was good, right? Like most Diet Coke drinkers do. But he wanted to confirm that it was all good. And when Jesus says that your following of me has to be pure, he walked away sad. Why? It's because he kind of wanted to be a follower. Right? He kind of wanted to be a follower. He wanted the label that the followers drink, but he didn't want to actually crack it open. When Jesus asked him to drink the drink that is completely pure, the everlasting water that Jesus was offering him, he walked away sad because he felt like this just should have been enough. And while maybe that's not the best example in the world of what it looks like to be a lukewarm Christian, I actually couldn't find a ton of examples in the Bible as, as to what a lukewarm Christian looks like. You want to know why? It's because lukewarm people make lukewarm stories. The Bible's not a lukewarm book. The Bible is full of every kind of passion, good and bad, imaginable. You don't see a ton of examples of lukewarm Christians in the Bible. You see tons of Christians going through like seasons of sin. That's totally different. We're not talking about that. Uh, but, but, but people, like, there's tons of people in the Bible that are, that are totally just drinking Coke. Tons of people in the Bible drinking water. But you just don't see a whole lot of this. Why? Because it doesn't make for a good story. The Bible's a great story. Bestseller. You can't drink diet and, fi- and find yourself in the Bible. You just can't. So some of you might be thinking, well, how do I know if I'm a lukewarm Christian? And if that's you, then I'm glad you asked. About 15 years ago, a um, uh, really famous comedian named Jeff Foxworthy uh, basically made his career off this like series of jokes that he made up, uh, and basically they, they were called, You Might Be a Redneck. Have you, do you guys remember this? Like a long time ago, he'd say things like, if you think sync is where you put your dirty dishes, you might be a redneck. That's my best Jeff Foxworthy, okay? Like, but you guys remember this, right? So let's do that. Let's play that game. But instead of you might be a redneck, let's play you might taste like diet. Okay? Now, some of these things uh, that I'm going to show you here in just a second, uh, kind of got some ideas from a book called Crazy Love, chapter 4. That's all you need to read in that book. If you, if you want to learn more about this, just go read chapter 4 of Crazy Love. It's really great. Um, some of these ideas I kind of I've, I've, I threw in because I've seen it over the years uh, in, my, in my short uh, career in ministry. I've seen this. But here, here's what I want to ask you to do. As I put these phrases on the screen, I want you to stop. I want you to really, really, really think, does this describe me? Is that fair? I'll tell you this right now. You won't get a thing out of this lesson if you you can't dial in right now. You won't get a thing out of it. But if you dial in, uh, you might be challenged and, uh, and, and you might grow. So let's play You Might Taste Like Diet. Are you ready? If your coworkers or neighbors or classmates are surprised to learn that you're a Christian one day, you might taste like a Diet Coke. Sure, you swear less, you drink less, you sleep around less than non-believers, usually. But outside of that, your life maybe doesn't look a whole lot different than everybody else. In fact, how about this? If you stopped believing in God literally right now, would anything major change other than your giving, your Wednesday and Sunday morning schedules? I mean, seriously, does anything else change, major? If not, then I'm going to suggest you might taste like diet. If you are moved by incredible stories and inspired by awesome sermons, but are never actually changed by them in your actions, you might taste like diet. So here's what you got to do for this one. 
Think about the last couple times when you're like, oh my goodness, that was awesome. I, I needed to hear that. But you didn't do anything about it. You just heard it. If that's you, then maybe you might taste like, like diet. Um, if you find yourself doing plenty of things to serve the Lord, but always find them to be a chore and never feel any real enthusiasm or passion about them, you might taste like a diet. If you rarely share your faith with non-believers, doesn't count if they're Christians. <laughs> you might taste like a diet. And here's the deal. Guys, I get this one. I've been a minister for six plus years. It is, it is not easier to share my faith now than it was on the first day. It just is. Sharing your faith is hard. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what kind of hat you wear. I get it. It makes sense. But let me put it this way. We, we don't share our faith because we fear rejection. There's really not another reason why we wouldn't do it, right? We fear rejection. That's why we don't share. Let me ask you this. Would you say that you fear rejection so much because you honestly fear other people's opinions about yourself more than you fear God's opinion about yourself? Because if you do, then I'm going to suggest that you might taste like a diet. If you find yourself often criticizing the way church runs more than you find yourself serving in the church, you might taste like a diet. I'll be honest with you right here, ready? I'm from, I'm the youth minister at San Jose. This is a problem for some people at San Jose. And I know that because sometimes it's a problem for me. It's very easy to be a church critic, even when you're running, you know, the stuff that's on stage. It's very easy. If you find that you can easily go long periods of time without allowing God to enter your mind besides your obligatory meal and bedtime prayer, you might taste like a diet. If you look back on your life, even just five or seven years ago, and can't see any real differences between the spiritual person you were then and the spiritual person you are now, then you might taste like a diet. Seriously, th think about it. Five years ago, spiritually, where were you? Is there a, a big change or not really? Because here's the deal. Here's what you've got to know. Lukewarm Christians are always stale. They just are. They don't move, they don't grow, they don't change. In fact, lukewarm Christians are usually the ones that hate change. If you are always quick to proclaim that you're not a lukewarm Christian without careful consideration and self-reflection, you might taste like a Diet Coke. So, this is, ready? When you found out that we're talking about lukewarm Christianity... And maybe you heard, you know, when, when I explained the little test that we're about to do, if your immediate gut reaction is, I can tune out because this isn't me, that is the first indicator that it's you. Why? It's because lukewarm Christians don't know they're lukewarm Christians. That's what makes it tough. They just don't. Let's do one more. If you always think that the sermon would be really good for someone else to hear, you might taste like a Diet Coke. And guys, this one is the one that hits home hardest for me. I've had plenty of opportunities over my six-year career to, to preach and to speak, even though I'm not a preacher. Uh, in fact, this is actually the second time I've done it here, and uh, I appreciate for, you know, you guys inviting me. I, I love to come out here and, uh, and, and be with you guys. Um, but, but I've preached at a couple different places and, and done a couple of different things, um, and I feel like this always happens to me. Without doubt, it always happens to me. There is somebody that always comes up afterwards and says, and they've got a good heart about it, right? Uh, they're trying to give me a great compliment, and, and, I, and I appreciate it. But they say something along the lines of like, you know, Corey, that was a great message. I was really inspired. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and, and man, I really wish so-and-so was here because they really needed to hear that. And if I can get serious with you for a second, you know what I hear when they say that? I hear, Corey... Well, I appreciated the message. I didn't need to hear it. But I do know a sinner who does. Now, this is a hard message today, right? I knew this was hard. I asked Mike, is it okay if I bring a little bit of a challenge? He said yes. 
I'm basically trying to put a thermometer un- under your spiritual tongue and asking you to figure out for yourself if you are hot, cold, or even worse, if you are lukewarm. But I feel called to do it. I feel called to give the message today, even though it's hard maybe for some to swallow. And Mandarin, here's the deal. Let me talk real with you for a second. Um, I- I'm trying my best to speak out of complete love. I love this church. This church is the church in Jacksonville I'm closest to other than my church. I know a lot of people at this church. Trey Clark was probably my best friend in Jacksonville. I'm really sad that he moved away, but he told me so many great stories and all the, all the great things that were happening here. And so I really do love this church, even though I don't go here. And because I love this church, I don't ever want Mandarin to become like the church at Laodicea. I hope Jesus will never look at this church as the status quo congregation, totally content and happy with exactly who you are. Unmoved and unchallenged to change and to grow and and to be different. Because here's the deal, lukewarm churches create lukewarm Christians who, if they're any good, create lukewarm converts. But guys, that's not who this church can be. This church can be so, so, so much more than that. This church can be a church that is passionate about God and the mission that he's given you. This church can be a church that truly loves God and truly loves people with all of their hearts. This church can be a church that desires to see the world change, but first understands that it starts with a change inside yourself. God wants so much for this church to become that and to reach its highest potential because God loves this church. And you want to know the reason why God loves this church so much? It's simply because God just loves you. That's it. God doesn't love this church because it does great things. God loves this church because he loves you. He cherishes you. He adores you, which is why it would absolutely break his heart to see you living a lukewarm Christianity. It would absolutely break his heart to see you trade in the living water that he literally created you to live and to drink from for a terrible and gross cheap can of diet. It just would. So if you've allowed the message to kind of maybe prick your heart this morning or uh, challenge you in some way, uh, when Josh gets up here in just a second, uh, we'll have a little bit of an invitation. I don't know who comes forward. Dan, if nobody, if you want to be the elder, maybe down here. If you want to come and pray with an elder uh, about not being lukewarm or about uh, turning on the hot faucet in your life or whatever it takes, uh, like, like we, we can do that and we can pray with you up front. Here's the deal. Remember, um, One prayer doesn't really change anything. That elder or whoever it is that's in your life that disciples you, they're going to need to push you along into a better direction. So this is just a step. It ain't even a jump. It's just a step, okay? But if you need to start taking a step towards becoming a Christian who is on fire, a Christian who is hot, then I want to invite you to do that uh, when Josh leads a song here in just a second. But before I do... I want to give you guys an opportunity to respond in another way, okay? Um, I want to challenge you guys to do something today. If, if, if one of the, remember one of the things that we said was uh, lukewarm Christians a lot of times hear inspiring sermons but find it hard to do anything about it? I'll give you an easy one today, okay? You can do something about it. So if you want to do something, write down what I'm about to say or remember it or whatever. But here's what I want you to do. When you're done with lunch today, I want you to go to a grocery store or go to a gas station and pick up a can of diet. Just buy one can, okay? Don't open it. Don't drink it. It's gross, remember? We don't like it. I want you to pick up a can of diet. And I want you to go home and I want you to pray over your can of Diet Coke. And then I want you to choose a place in your life physically where you're going to see it every single day. Maybe it's your bathroom sink. Maybe it's your school locker. Maybe it's your work desk. Maybe it's the dresser next to your bed. I don't know where it is. But, but put it somewhere where you're going to see it every single day. And I want you to challenge yourself that when you see it, you're going to remember that you have to choose to be either hot or cold, but you cannot choose to be both. You cannot. You cannot choose to be a diet. You cannot choose to taste like a diet. Choose to be hot or cold, doesn't matter, but choose one of them. In the spirit of the Old Testament, we're going to let a Diet Coke can be our Ebenezer stone, where we see it every single day and we say, 
yes, I am going to be different. I promise you that. I'm going to be different. So that's your challenge. Uh, do that today after service. We're going to close um, with, uh, with uh, I think we're going to close with, with a scripture real quick. Um, my clicker's not working, so uh, is there a scripture or no? Yep, there we go. It's what we were already read today, but I, I think it fits so well with what we're talking about. So I'm going to read this scripture, and then Josh is, is going to get up. It says this, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you're going to serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in, those in whose land you are living now, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua. Let's stand together as we sing. All to Jesus I so.